the anthem. Happy birthday to you. Happy
Let no one in this place go hungry or in need, because we are always ready to lend a generous hand. Thank you for providing all that we need. May the love that we show to each other be a picture of your love to this community around us. We are one of the Spirit, and we part from this place of worship. And as we part, let us still be joined in heart and hope and mind. And we hope to meet again. That love of Jesus Christ we experience here, may we spread his love to everyone. Let us pass it on. Eternal God, we ask a special blessing on each and every one who is here today. And those who are traveling through, like Scott, Lord, we ask you be with him. And take him where he's going safely. And take him back to his home safely. For all those who are traveling to here, we ask for your mercies, traveling mercies. For all of those who are traveling from here to there, we can ask for your, your traveling mercies. Lord, we ask that you would bless and heal each and every one of us. We thank you, Lord, for another birthday for uh, some of our people, our youth. We ask that you bless them and guide them to the right colleges, the right places, the right choices in life. Be with them now and forever. So please bless our president and the cabinet above us and all those who govern us. Help them to know that Jesus Christ is Lord. Help them to govern with the Spirit of Christ leading them. These are our blessings we ask in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <laughs> who taught us how to say our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we just not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Uh, please turn with me to him 420, 420. Breathe on me.
turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, John chapter 20. And uh, I'm going to read verses 19 and follow. It's found on page 111 of the Pew Bibles. Page 1. One, one, the few Bibles. Listen to the word of God. On the evening of that day, that was last Sunday, uh, Resurrection Day, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, Sunday, the doors being shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When Jesus had said this, he showed his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and place my finger in the mark of the nails, and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. Eight days later, which is the way the Jews count, is Sunday today again. His disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. The doors were shut and Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not be faithless but believe in me. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Please turn with me to the book of Acts, which is just a few pages over. And it's on page uh, 116. One, one, uh, Acts chapter 4, verses 32. Following. Now the company of those who believed, that's all the believers, were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things which he or she possessed belonged to them, but they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was surnamed by the apostle Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold the field which belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. May the words of our lips and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. From those two passages, especially from that Acts passage, my question is, what can I do next? What can we do next? The I is each and every one of us. What can I do next? How can I, how can we testify to the resurrection of the Lord? Well, my friends, what we 
would you call a group, a community of people who share their cars, they share their clothes, they share their couches, they share their computers? Well, if you've been around during the Cold War days, you probably call them communists, but be careful. We can call them Christians. The book of Acts tells us that the whole group of those, all who believed, were of one heart, one mind, one soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any of their own possessions. But everything they owned was held in common. I just read that in Acts 4.32. So they sold everything they had and they brought it to the church and laid it at the feet of the disciples. In first century Jerusalem, first century church, the first big church after Jesus Christ was resurrected and went back to heaven. I know this time began after Jesus Christ came. So this was the first century. The members of the church shared everything they had with each other. They were trying to build a caring, a sharing, a nurturing community. A loving church. A church where people cared about each other. People loved each other. People looked forward to seeing each other. Every Sunday morning, I, I look forward to seeing you. I hope you look forward to seeing each other. On one occasion during the uh, Cold War, an American, a Czech, and a Soviet agreed to meet. And they set the time, and the Czech was late, so he came and said, I'm so sorry. Um, sorry I'm late for the meeting. He said, but I was held up in a line. I wanted to buy some meat. So the American said, a line? What's a line? And the Russian said, what's meat? Yeah. <laughs> well, obviously, the godless society of communism, which kind of try to be acts, first century church, without God, has failed. During the first century, Christians had everything in common. There was not a needy Person. No one had needs. No, they might have had wants. And uh, today I, I wouldn't mind a, a Cadillac or a Mercedes or whatever. I want one of those. Yeah. But you know, the Lord has provided my needs. And I have a car that brings me from St. John to Hare, and a car that takes me back safely. That first century church was not a godless, harsh, cruel society with dictators. But it was a God-loving community. A loving community that valued people above possessions. Christians shared because they wanted to share. Not because they were in a totalitarian society where they had to share. This was something that came from the heart. One of the goals of the first century church, just one of them, there are several others, was to alleviate the poverty of widows and orphans. And to this day, widows and orphans have a hard time. People sold their homes, their possessions, their fields, and they placed the proceeds the money that they got at the feet of the apostles who distributed to each as any had need. So there was not a needy person among them. There was a man we just spoke about. His first name was Joseph. But uh, the apostles changed his name to Barnabas. They called him the son of encouragement. What a good guy. He encouraged Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark. He encouraged Paul. And you know, Paul wrote most of the New Testament. 
You don't read much about Barnabas, but he was the son of encouragement. He was the one behind, like the one behind, the, the wife who's behind the throne, or the queen who pushes the king forward. And Barnabas was a Levite. Now, Levite, I mean, uh, Levi was one of the sons of Jacob, and his children were the priests, and the, the ones who took care of the synagogues and the temple. He was a Levite and a native of Cyprus. And he sold all that he had. He had some lands and he sold it all and he brought the money and he put it at the feet of the apostles. Uh, not too long ago, very recently, a young church member was looking at Facebook and uh, she was surprised when she saw that one of her church members was boasting on Facebook, or at least announcing on Facebook, that he had bought a car. He had bought a Maserati. Now, she kind of wondered, well, why would anyone want to buy a Maserati for $160,000? Especially when that same young man was in church the week before, the week before he bought his car, before he put it on Facebook, and there was a young man who testified and said, I've lost my job. I have no food for my family. And that young man walked out and spent $160,000 on a Maserati. And then he boasted, I paid cash. And here was Someone he knew, there was someone in church who said to him and this young lady who saw his uh, posting on Facebook, I have no food to feed my family. How insensitive can we get to boast of our good fortunes? I mean, if I wasn't going to buy an American car, I'd buy a Mercedes for eighty thousand and have eighty thousand, give eighty thousand to the church. If you know, if I had one hundred sixty thousand to flaunt, how could we ignore the needs of our Christian sisters and brothers, and the needs of other sisters and brothers across the world? Listen to these words which I just read. Acts 4.32. Now the company of believers, that company, that's all of the believers, were of one heart and soul and mind. A great sense of harmony and unity of purpose and a great spiritual bond existed among the Christian believers. Psalm 133 puts it this way. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Imagine a church, or in this case two churches, where everyone was indeed unified and working towards one common goal. God's people living together in unity. God's people looking out for each other, not <coughs> backstabbing or any of the things that happen in some churches. Let us pray that Jesus Christ will help us be more like that first century church, living in unity. For there is great power in unity and purpose. When we are reunited, we can spot another person's need. We can just hear a person's voice. Just a few days ago, one of our sons called. And Dorothy sensed there was something in his voice. We remember some two years ago, Dorothy left because his hand, his right hand became paralyzed and she went 
when they operated on him and they reamed out his back and his hand, he got life in his hand once again. And just this week, just a few days ago, he called to say once again, his right hand is now paralyzed. As good Christians, we can even sense others needs. We can hear them in their voices. We can see their, them sending their children to school in the snow without a, without a coat of them. We can sense, we can see others' needs. So Winston Churchill, uh, one of the prime ministers of Britain, once said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. We make a living by the salary, the wages we get. We make a living by what we get, what we sell, or our produce, or whatever. But we make a life by what we give. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with buying a Maserati. I'd love to have one myself. Nothing wrong with spending your money the way you want to, if you've got it, flaunt it. But at the same time, we must be conscious. We must be aware that there are other needs in the world. That's one of the reasons why I pray for uh, Brother Bill Gates. I hope he gets more money. Because he gives away so much. He's so kind and gracious and generous. Uh, giving out of the blessings that God has given to him. My friends, as Christians, we work to create a caring, sharing community. We share because we want to share. We share because God has blessed us. And God has said, I'm going to bless you that you might be a blessing to someone else. So my friends, work hard. Make all you can. But remember that it is God who blesses you. Ask the same questions Jesus would ask in any situation. WWJD, what would Jesus do with this neighbor? And why has Jesus put me next to this neighbor? I mean, the neighbor might be in Haiti, as, as, as you young ladies uh, make dresses for the, the neighbors in Haiti. The neighbors might be somewhere else. But why did God give me all of these blessings? And what would Jesus do if God, if Jesus had my materials and my, my thread and my machines? What would Jesus do? Like the first generation, the first uh, century of Jerusalem church, we ask, what can we do next? We have a responsibility, a God-given responsibility to the needy in our midst. Whether that need be financial, whether it be emotional, whether it be social, whether it be spiritual. Let's be involved with others. Some of the neediest people in the world are simply people who find themselves all alone in this world. You know, we can identify the loner. Yeah, he's a loner, she's a loner. But can we draw near? Can we find out what's going on? Loneliness is a need we can all help meet, each and every one of us. There's some child in school who never plays with anyone else. That's not usual. Let's find out more. There are all kinds of needy people in the world. It's, it's not always financial. Uh, some needs are fine. You know, we put our hands in our pocket and give them a few dollars. That's, that's fine. It's not always that. There are the needs. And let us seek to find a need of any kind. Seek to meet that need. Acts 4 says, With great power the apostles 
testified to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ with great power they saw him crucified they saw him risen they went out and they testified to the resurrection of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ may we you and I continue to testify to the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and how do we do that? By showing love one for another. By trying to meet the needs of those who have needs. And asking, what can I do next? And the Lord, the blessing to the reading and the hearing and doing of God's holy word. As we stand and we repeat the response. Hymn number 880. Yeah. Hymn number 881. Hymn 881. Repeat that together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. By the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sat at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. Forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please uh, turn to our bulletins. Let us repeat our offering prayer together. Together, Holy Lord, your great grace is on us. Move us to proclaim with these gifts that you are our Lord and our God. Accept these offerings to your glory, honor, and praise. Amen. Please be seated as we lift the offering. Yeah. 